on the 27th of January 2008 at around 8.30pm in Bridgewater, a town in Canada. The police department received a report of a missing 12-year-old girl, Carissa Boudreaux. The report had come in from her mother, Penny Boudreaux. Penny claimed that she had left her daughter sat in the car in the supermarket's parking lot as she went inside to shop for groceries. On Penny's return to the vehicle, Carissa was no longer inside. As the extensive investigation and search for Carissa went underway, Penny made a tearful plea to the media for her daughter to return, as well as asking for assistance from the community in finding her. I don't know really what to say, and I hope she's listening. I don't know if I can do this. It's okay. We all love you. We all love Carissa. We love you. Her grandparents are looking for you. All of us are. I don't know where you are, but just come home or call or something, please. And all your friends are looking for you, and we're all worried. We just want you home safe. It's not like we're going to get mad. We just want you home safe. Please. The town rallied together in an attempt to find Carissa and to return her home safely. But sadly, nearly two weeks later, on the 9th of February 2008, Carissa Boudreaux's body was found buried in the snow. The police searched tirelessly for Carissa's murderer, but after reaching multiple dead ends, they decided to launch an undercover operation in order to trick their prime suspect into telling the truth. And the suspect did just that. In a recorded confession, the suspect described the grim details of what had happened to Carissa that day and the motive behind why she had to die. Carissa Page Boudreaux was born on the 4th of October 1995 to her parents Penny and Paul Boudreaux. Carissa was a happy kid who liked to laugh, sing, skip and play. She enjoyed her Nintendo DS, swimming, stuffed animals, reading and listening to music, like the Spice Girls, Miley Cyrus and Hilary Duff. Her father Paul described her as a daddy's little girl and said he and Carissa were very close. He said Carissa was like her grandmother, someone who could always turn a negative situation into a positive thing. Carissa had a dog called Lady and was known for her love of animals, saying she wanted to one day become a veterinarian. Though she had a close and loving relationship with her father, it was described that Carissa had a strained relationship with her mother Penny and the duo frequently bickered. Paul and Penny split during Penny's pregnancy and Penny actually went on to marry Paul's brother, Shane. Shane and Penny then also split when Carissa was 10. As Carissa's parents weren't together, she primarily lived with her mother, but one day she asked to go and live with her father. After living with Paul for five months, however, she changed her mind as she missed her mother, so she moved back in with Penny, who at the time was living with her boyfriend Vernon in a two-bedroom flat in Bridgewater. All seemed to be going well, and Carissa was settling back into her school life, and life back in Bridgewater. But then, on the 27th of January 2008, Carissa suddenly went missing. On the 27th of January 2008, at around 8.30pm, Penny called the Bridgewater Police Department to report Carissa missing. She said, that they had gone to the Bridgewater Sobeys store, but argued in the car, so Penny went into the store on her own to get the groceries and left Carissa behind in the car in the parking lot. She didn't want to go in the store with me, which was fine. I mean, she doesn't usually like to go in, so... When Penny returns to the car, Carissa was missing, so Penny called the police. Everyone immediately began to panic, as Carissa was not dressed appropriately for the heavy snow and cold weather outside. She was only wearing a black hoodie, a vest, blue jeans and pink crocs. The community immediately sprung into action and the search for Carissa began. An intensive search of the town and surrounding area was ordered, including sweeps of the now partially frozen La Have River. They believed that time truly was of the essence, as Carissa was so lightly dressed and the weather was so harsh and cold. Despite the snow slowing their efforts, locals braved the storm to hand out missing person flyers and to search for Carissa. When the weather began to clear, 
and the river started to thaw. Divers were sent in to search for Carissa, but she still wasn't found. The public put up posters, created pages on social media, and donated money to her campaign. On two separate occasions, Penny appealed to the public for help in finding her daughter. I just want to tell you that you have lots of people who love you and want you home. It's hard to not know where your kid is. I'm done. Just under two weeks later, on the 9th of February 2008, a break in the case was made. A woman reported that her nine-year-old son had seen toes sticking out of the snow on a riverbank at a turn-off area. Police quickly arrived at the scene and the human remains were identified as Carissa Boudreaux's. Carissa's body was found with her jeans on her right lower leg and her underwear down to her knees. The chief medical examiner concluded that the cause of death was asphyxiation and that Carissa had been strangled. The following week, Carissa was laid to rest. So many people came to pay their last respects that they spilled out into the car park of the funeral home. Reverend Perry Ingersoll led the service, which included a slideshow depicting various moments in Carissa's short life, accompanied by her favourite song. He said, No human reason or sense can be found in the sense that such a young, beautiful, energetic life would be snatched so quickly away before its hopes and plans had even began to be realised. Two of Carissa's aunts read poems to the weeping crowd but there was one person amongst the congregation that remained stone-faced throughout the emotional service, Penny Boudreaux. Shortly after her daughter's funeral, Penny moved to Halifax, which was about 90 kilometres down Highway 103. The police were keen to solve Carissa's murder, so they sprung into action and interviewed hundreds of people, but no suspects really came up. With the lack of suspects, along with Penny's strange behaviour following her daughter's murder, police had a theory in mind. They believed that Penny herself, and potentially her partner Vernon, were involved in Carissa's murder, so they dug deep. Whilst police conducted a search of Penny and Vernon's apartment, they found a series of notes written by Carissa from December 2007, where she expressed her feelings towards her life at home. The first note said, I'm sad because 1. I have to go to school tomorrow, 2. I miss Shane and Tracy, 3. I have to go to bed at 9.30 instead of 11, 4. I live in an apartment, 5. There is no room for my stuff, 6. I feel crowded, 7. End of story, my life sucks until we live in a house, by Carissa. The second note said, I'm mad because 1. Mum is engaged to Vernon. 2. Mum made me move here. 3. Mum broke up with Shane. 4. I want a bigger room. 5. I don't like Vernon living with us. 6. The end of my life is ruined. By Carissa. On the 11th of February, neighbours reported details of a disturbance coming from Penny and Vernon's apartment. They said that it sounded like water was running and that Penny was in the bathtub as Vernon spoke to her. People upstairs said that uh, they argued quite a bit, they could hear him. Arguing and all that. Neighbours overheard Vernon saying over and over again, Pen, how could you do this? Pen, Pen, come on, speak, Pen. How could you do this? How could you do this? I don't understand. You got me involved. The police arrested both Vernon and Penny on the 14th of February, but as there was not enough evidence to lay charges, they were released the following day. Following this failed arrest, investigators felt like they had exhausted all of their options so they decided to conduct an undercover operation to get to the truth. They launched an elaborate undercover operation known as Mr. Big in order to find out the couple's involvement in the murder. Undercover agents posed as members of a crime syndicate and befriended Penny and Vernon. Vernon denied being involved with the murder, but he said he had suspicions that Penny was involved and that he was staying close to her to avoid being implicated in the crime. He said, I told them whatever I could to help them. I always tried to help them until they started looking at me and accused me. I couldn't cooperate then. I was scared to death for me. The agents then went after Penny, and four months later, they convinced her that they could possibly make her problem go away. Penny believed that the officer was a crime boss who could help her cover up the murder if she confessed to them. 
and in June of that same year, Penny did just that. Penny confessed that she killed Carissa after Vernon gave her an ultimatum for their relationship to survive. According to Penny, Vernon said that she had to pick between him or her daughter. Penny confessed to the undercover officer that she would do anything for Vernon and the thought of losing him was harder than the thought of losing her daughter. Penny went so far as to reenact the action on one of the undercover agents and even took them to the scene of the murder. She also wrote a detailed account of what happened that night. Penny said that on the 27th of January, she went for a drive with Carissa at around 3 to 4 p.m. They drove for a couple of hours and were talking. She felt things got a little out of hand and both of them were angry. And Penny said she did what she had to do. They drove to Sobeys and Penny went inside the store, leaving her daughter Carissa inside the car. She purchased some juice and bacon and before returning to her car, she called Vernon and lied to him by saying that Carissa was missing and not inside the vehicle. She then returns to the car and put the groceries in the trunk and while she did this, she grabbed a piece of twine and put it in her pocket, all whilst Carissa was alive and well inside the car. Carissa kept asking to get out of the car, so Penny drove to a remote spot on William Hebb Road and told Carissa that if she wanted to get out, to then get out. They both got out of the car and argued. Penny went to grab her daughter, but it was slippery, so she tackled her and Carissa fell on her back. Penny used her knee on Carissa's chest to pin her down, whilst Carissa said her last words, Mummy, don't. Penny then wrapped the twine around her hands and put it around Carissa's neck and strangled her. Penny said she could feel Carissa trying to move her hands and that they were digging at the ground, but then she stopped fighting and moving and was dead. When Carissa had stopped breathing, Penny dragged her body and put her in the passenger side of the vehicle. Penny placed the twine in an empty Tim Hortons cup, which she later threw into a bin. Our understanding from, from what Ms. Boudreaux described, she was slumped in the passenger seat in the, the well area, uh, likely not visible to the public. Uh, and uh, at that point, she drove her up to Tim Hortons, took the twine, put it in a Tim Hortons cup, and put it into a Tim Hortons garbage can, where obviously with the many Tim Hortons cups would never be discovered. Penny then drove to a secluded spot along the La Have River and parts the car. She drives Carissa's body out of the car, using her jeans as leverage. Carissa's jeans and underwear and socks came off as she dragged Carissa to the bank's edge. Penny decided to leave these items of clothing off Carissa, as she felt this would make people think Carissa had been assaulted. She then rolled Carissa over the edge of the bank, knowing that the weather was calling for lots of snow and that she wouldn't be found for a while. Penny then got back into her car and took Carissa's hoodie, vest and a single crock and threw them into a bin by the Bridgewater swimming pool. When Penny got home at around 7pm later that evening, she told Vernon that Carissa had run away and she then called the police at around 8.30pm. She also called friends and teachers to try and spread her story. Thirty-four-year-old Penny Patricia Boudreaux was arrested on Friday, June thirteenth, in Halifax. She will answer to the charge of first-degree murder on Monday, June sixteenth, at Bridgewater Provincial Court. Penny Boudreaux was arrested and charged with first-degree murder of her own daughter. However. Penny pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of second-degree murder, and the plea deal was agreed to avoid a trial. As Penny made her first court appearance, she clutched a tissue and sobbed, but said nothing as the murder charge was read to her. She was led out of the door of the courthouse, and a number of people had gathered outside and taunted her. One shouted, Child's Killer and another shouted murderer. Penny Boudreaux received a life sentence and under the so-called faint hope clause, she would be able to apply for parole after 15 years. Justice Margaret Stewart, who handed down the sentence, said the horrible crime merited a harsh sentence, saying, you can never call yourself mother in conjunction with Carissa's name again. The words mummy don't from a trusting and loving Carissa are there to haunt you for the rest of your life. The court did rule, however, that Vernon was not involved in the murder. 
Following Penny's arrest, Vernon claimed that he hadn't offered an ultimatum, and instead had suggested that something needed to be done about the constant arguing between Penny and Carissa. He claimed he was frustrated with the fighting between Penny and her daughter, so claimed he told her to let Carissa live with her father again, or he was going to leave. You said, you know, it's either Carissa or me. No, actually I didn't, actually I said, because they were fighting them quite a bit. And I asked him, you know, you have to do something about this is not a productive family when they're arguing and fighting. And I could come home and hear them screaming and hollering, right, as I was coming up the stairs. So I knew they you know, and I was new in her family, so I thought, well, when we all sit down, we're going to see a counselor or something. That's what I wanted to, you know, because to, to show a kid that because she's going through a rough time where the divorce was, right? Vernon said that he felt immeasurable guilt about what had happened to Carissa, saying, It was just avoidable. I think about her all the time, though. After Penny began serving her sentence at the Nova Institution for Women in Truro, she was diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and borderline personality traits. She completed a number of offender programs and has apparently never been classed as a security risk. A psychological assessment stated that she falls within a very low range to reoffend. Therefore, over time, Penny has been granted more freedom from behind bars. She was moved to a minimum security sector of the prison, and as of 2019, Penny has been granted six escorted temporary absences from prison so that she can attend church. The decision from the parole board included a description of Penny's early life, stating that she was hurt by the death of her mother. She told the board that growing up, she had experienced the loss of her mother at a young age as she had committed suicide. She told the board, that she had never really spoken about it until she came to prison. In terms of her current offence, she felt that she was desperate at the time, desperate to be the perfect mother, desperate not to be alone, and unable to ask for help. The understanding that we have for motive uh, appeared to be twofold from the statements she gave to the undercover operator. Uh, the first and primary motivating factor appeared to be that uh, she felt that Carissa's presence was a danger to the relationship continued between her and, and Vernon, and that she had to kill her to uh, take care of that problem. And secondly, uh, there was discussion by her about uh, this 12-year-old talking badly about her to friends and to people in the community, and she didn't want that to happen, uh, particularly uh, at this stage and that uh, those two appeared to be the factors which uh, ended up motivating her to kill a dog. Penny told the board that she didn't want to tell others about the murder because she didn't plan to be alive much longer. The board said that since Penny's been in prison, Penny has realized she could reach out for help and she's also restored a relationship with her father and has expressed that the church has been important to her. Penny, have you got anything to say? The judge said herself, crocodile tears, and that's all it's ever been, and that's all it ever will be. Carissa's father, Paul Boudreaux, still tries to comprehend what happened, saying, I can't call it anything other than a senseless act. For, for a parent to just up make that decision, I still can't comprehend it. She had many options. There was many people around her that would have gladly, gladly, you know, had I known this was going to happen, I would never ever let her go back. But I mean, what parent's going to try to you know, say, no, you can't go back and see your mother? The center of my happiness is shattered, and hopes and dreams wiped away in one selfish act. The feeling of relief here in Bridgewater is tainted by new feelings of disgust. Members of the community, even experienced police officers, saying they're at a total loss to understand how a mother could do this to her daughter. Years later, the trauma of what happened to Carissa still remains in Bridgewater. To this day, the public still leaves flowers in the place where her body was found. And to me, it's just heartwarming to know that they still think of Carissa. She was just a normal 12-year-old girl who had dreams of being a vet and loved life. For it to be snatched away from her in such a cruel way by her own mother is completely disgusting and hard to get my head around. As always, my heart goes out to the Bridgewater community and to Carissa's father in particular. Paul is now remarried and has two children, and he says he often talks about Carissa with his children, telling them that their sister Carissa is up with the angels and with her loving grandmother. <laughs>